thank everybody for coming. Please, please give a warm welcome for our first mayor of Palo Alto, Lydia Koo. And let's get started with the program. Good evening, everybody. It's lovely seeing all of you. Uh, I, I see so many different nationalities here, and we all came together. So thank you so much. And I'm not the first mayor of Palo Alto. I'm think, I think I'm probably the 40-something mayor. <laughs> but thank you. Um, so good evening. My name is Lydia Ku. I'm the mayor of the city of Palo Alto. We're taking a little break from our city council meeting tonight to welcome each of you to tonight's multi-faith peace and friendship vigil. Tonight I'm joined by Vice Mayor Greer Stone, who is at the back, Council Members Pat Burt, Council Member Ed Lowing, Council Member Julie Lifcott Haynes, Council Member Greg Tanaka, and Council Member Vicki Vinker. Will you please step up with me? Please? Thank you so much. So everybody can see. Uh, I also want to I also want to ask you to join me in thanking Ms. Samina Sundas, Sundas and her committee for their commitment to bringing peace, love, and friendship to our communities. Ms. Sundas, thank you so much. It is important that we come together to remember September 11th, 2001. Every 9-11, we should remember it every 9-11, as it was a time of heartbreak, loss, and anger. And we must challenge ourselves not to be overtaken by the wrong emotions and take it out on those who are innocent. We must respond to people, as people, with friendship and compassion, rather than reacting to the person with anger and ignorance. Let's honor each person as each are unique. The post-11 generations will not have lived or witnessed the horrors, heartbreak, and loss of 9-11 in 2001, nor will the generation, generations post-9-11 have witnessed the kindness, compassion, and love that people showed each other. As 9-11 is history, let's heed the words of George Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Let's be sure to remember, and let's commit to live with honor, peace, and build friendships. Shall we do this together? Yes. yes. Thank you. And at this point, I'd like to ask you to put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you, and let's lower our heads for a moment of silence. Thank you so much. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you for taking the break. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Mayor Lydia and all those who have joined us today. Um, as is tradition, we will be starting with the recitation of the Holy Quran presented by Hala and Mustafa Faruqi. Hala Faruqi is a sixth grader at the JLS Middle School and enjoys soccer, arts, and crafts. Mustafa is a fourth grader at Fair Meadow Elementary and enjoys soccer, wrestling, and chess. If you will have me, please welcome to the stage Hala and Mustafa Faruqi. I will be reciting Ayah 13 of Surah Al-Hujurat in the Holy Quran. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Ya Ayyuhal Nalladheena Amanu Amin Jib Aminu Akhrajadul Ak Let's try it. Okay, 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر أنت وجعلناكم وجعلناكم شعوبا وكعبا إلا لتعرفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقمكم إن الله أليم قدير Thank you And for the translation, O oh mankind, indeed, we created you from from male and female and, the, and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. Surah Hijrat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we will proceed on to our multi-faith prayers. Starting off, we will have Farha Andradi Andrabi, the co-founder and president of MPA Masalla, and a chaplain in training. Sure. Next. But while she is coming, let's move on to Reverend Burke Owens, the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church of Palo Alto. Please join me on stage, Reverend. Assalamu alaikum. Lord and ruler of all, we come here tonight to remember a terrible day, a terrible day for all people when it was found that once again, humans did not know how to talk to one another. They only knew how to hit and kill one another. There were two visions at war at that time as I see it. One was the vision of a culture and a region that had been downtrodden and hurt for too long and it wanted to strike back to say, no, we will not become the first world because the first world is wrong. And there was the first world saying, what's the problem? We're not aware of any problem. People do not know how to speak to one another. People do not know how to share their worries and their fears and their longings with one another until it builds up and builds up and then they lash out. I hope we can find a way to get beyond that. And some days I worry we can't. I'd like to talk about two visions two possible visions that might help us get through this. The Lord be with you. Mosque, temple, all the world with its souls, memories, longings, and desires yearn for the ancient vision of the prophets to be fulfilled. The eyes blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongues of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert and the burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. All this from Isaiah 35. By the spirit a vision wells up in the people of God who yearn for healing and restoration, for justice, not terrorism, for forgiveness, not hate. Then God brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple. South of the altar, it was ankle deep. Then it was knee deep. Then it was up to the waist. Then it was a river I could not cross. God led me back along the bank of the river. As I came back, I saw on the bank of the river a great many trees on one side and on the other. God said to me, Whosoever the tr river goes, everything will live. There will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. From Ezekiel 47. Now a different vision. For we work hard to build a vision and even harder to realize it. Often we need to see through the eyes of the beloved, the eye of the soul that is divine and eternal and also compassionate. We must struggle, as Paul the Apostle tells us, 
to realize our call in this life and recognize who it is that calls us. A poem from Rumi, the great theologian and mystic. One dervish to another, what was your vision of God's presence? I haven't seen anything, but for the sake of conversation, I will tell you a story. The presence is there in front of me, a fire on the left, a lovely stream on the right. One group walks toward the fire into the fire. Another walks toward, I'm having the same trouble you had earlier reading. The iPad keeps wanting to do something different. And I tell it, no, but will it listen to me? No, it will not. <laughs> OK, where did you go now? Oh, come on, come back to me, please. Oh, thanks be to God, you've returned. <laughs> uh, the presence is there in front of me, a fire on the left, a lovely stream on the right. One group walks toward the fire, into the fire, and another walks toward the sweet, flowing water. No one knows which are blessed and which not. Whoever walks into the fire appears suddenly in the stream, and a head goes under water, and that head pokes out of the fire. Most people guard against going into the fire, and so end up in it. Those who love the water of pleasure make it their devotion are cheated with this reversal. The trickery goes further, for the voice of the fire tells the truth, saying, I am not fire, I am fountainhead. Come unto me and don't mind the sparks if you are a friend of God. Fire is your water. Everyone's vision is different, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. Building vision is like building a church or a family or a business or a community. It can be messy, filled with unexpected complications, and this is what we have to do in order to create God's kingdom here on earth. Listen, then speak. Reflect, then act. Pray, then listen again. God asks that we keep it at it and not give up. Let's build a vision together, one that we can share and work upon, one that we can understand. Though all different, let us see what we share in common and then respect and honor the difference. A rule of life often attributed to John Wesley tells us, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend, for the beautiful words and beautiful reflections. Next, I'd like to welcome Farah Andravi. She is the co-founder and president of MPPA, MVPA Musalla, and she is a chaplain in training. Please welcome to the stage. Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you all. As we gather here this year to honor the victims of 9-11, their families, first responders, we are thankful for this opportunity to renew our commitment to peace, mutual respect, goodwill, and community building. Earlier today, I was thinking about this peace picnic and its aims and the elements that help establish peace in a heterogeneous society. I was reminded of some verses of Quran that remind us of both the elements that prevent the establishment of peace in a society and the factors, the ethical approaches that foster and nurture peace in a diverse community. The chapter Al-Qasas, the story, the word Al-Qasas means the story, tells us in detail the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, or Moses, how God sent him to call out a tyrant ruler, the Pharaoh, as he oppressed the people that he ruled. Quran highlights how Pharaoh was able to establish his, his unjust rule, and I quote from verse 4 of Surah Al-Qasas, indeed Pharaoh exalted himself in the land and made its people into factions, so he used to divide his people into factions oppressing a sector among them, killing their sons and keeping their females alive. Indeed, he, Pharaoh, 
was one who spread fasad. Now the Arabic word fasad is a comprehensive term. It means corruption, but also the end of peace, the lack of peace. So Pharaoh was able to maintain that lack of peace through division, through dividing his society. In Surah Al-Hujrat, which means the apartments, verse 13, Quran guides its readers to live in peace and harmony in the society by making us reflect on the reality of our creation. And I quote, O humankind, we created you from a male and female and formed you into nations and tribes so that you may recognize and know one another. Surely the noblest, most honorable among you in God's sight is the one best in piety, righteousness, and reverence for God. Surely God is all-knowing, all-aware. We ask God to accept and bless our efforts <coughs> at community peace building and to protect our communities from those who spread hate, deception, fear, and disunity among us. God, help us recognize truth as truth and give us provisions to follow it and make us see falsehood as falsehood and give us the provisions to stay away from it. Now, this is a prayer again, uh, an Islamic prayer, and I'll just read it in English. God, you are the absolute peace, and all peace comes from you. So fill our lives with peace and grant us the entrance into the abode of peace. Blessed art thou, O Lord, O owner of majesty and honor. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now to finish off the multi-faith prayers, I'd, I'd like to welcome Rabbi Chaim Korzynski. He is the rabbi of the congregation at Chaim. Please welcome to the stage, Rabbi Chaim. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Samina, for once again bringing us all together on this important day of remembrance. I always appreciate that this day, this gathering together, often uh, coincides or comes close to the Jewish New Year, which begins this Friday evening. And there's a, a teaching that says that the way that we bring in the New Year is an omen for the way we're going to live the coming year. And so I always feel very... Uh, heartwarmed and, and optimistic when I come here and feel that I and we are ushering a new year together. And there's a Jewish prayer that is recited in the evening, right around this time, as we're transitioning from day to evening, which asks God to look after us, to protect us throughout the night. And the words are Ifros Aleinu Sukat Shlomecha. God spread over us a sukkah, a canopy of peace, of shalom. And shalom will not work, shalom will not endure unless we all feel a sense of responsibility to uphold it, to promote it, to pursue it. And therefore, I'd like to invite all of us to join me in singing this prayer. And I'll let you know how we're going to do it. And I'd like to actually ask for a little bit of help from Rabbi Amy Eilberg and Elisheva Alexander, because there are three parts. And if we can pull this off, then I feel, I'll feel even more optimistic about peace in the coming year. <laughs> Your parts are very easy. First part. Hey, oh, do you have a couple microphones? Oh, hey, try that. Hey, oh, oh, hey, one more time. Hey, oh, 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 Shalom. 
And if, if anybody else out there knows this prayer or wants to try their try a little bit of Hebrew, uh, please join me. I see Rabbi Shelley Lewis. I hope he'll join me as well. Ready? Okay. Let's uh, let's we'll start with the Shalom. Then we'll add the Yada Dai and then I'll add the Ufor Salenu Sukat Shalom. One, two, ready, go. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you so much. Can we have another round of applause for Haim and all the other speakers? Thank you so much. You know, as, I don't know if anybody else saw this, but you know, in Islam, at least we have a distinction of uh, faith. There's one thing called hukukul Allah, is in your relationship with God. And there's another thing called hukukul ibad, or your relationship with other people, or your rights for other people. And I think all of the speakers that we've had so far have kind of drilled in that fact that every person has their own unique relation with God. But at the end of the day, what's really going to be the test is what's your relationship with other people. So as we go into this next section of the peace program, I just want to say that let us think about what we will do for other people and let us reflect on what the speakers are saying. I would now like to bring to the stage Reverend Dr. Diana Gibson from the Multi-Faith Voices for Peace and Justice. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here to represent Multi-Faith Voices for Peace and Justice, one of the sponsors of this event, and also to be a part of this event that, as you all know, is pulled together by American Muslim Voice Foundation and our friend, colleague, sister, Samina Sundas. 
we have already heard that every faith tradition at its essence teaches us peace, teaches us to live together with joy and to celebrate our diversity and, and our dignity. And yet we gather to remember the victims of this day and its aftermath. We remember the people who were killed, their families, and the first responders. And we remember those who have suffered and died as we've responded to that tragedy. As we've chosen to respond, unfortunately, with more fear and more violence, the violence of war. There are countless victims and families, the people of Afghanistan, of Iraq, and neighboring countries, U.S. soldiers and international soldiers who have fallen, and the violence and fear that's been perpetrated against Muslims, against immigrants, and against other people of color. In this moment of silence, I invite us to hold and honor all of those lives, each precious and beautiful. In my tradition, each made in the image of God and sacred. We gather to honor those beautiful, precious lives, and at the same time, to say no, to protest their death, to say that doesn't have to be the way we respond. And as we, and we do that, and we work, and we pray to create a world of kindness, and friendship, and peace. When Haim was leading us in singing, my whole body, I've never sung that before, my whole body, my every cell was intent on singing Shalom. And I invite us in this moment of silence to move into that intention to seek Shalom, Salam, peace with every cell in our body. As we remember those who have died, let us also honor the peace that our world needs now. Let us be together in a moment of silence. Salam, shalom, peace. I also bring um, readings from the September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrow in the form of a letter from Robin Bernstein Donati, who is the co-chair of the Islamic, uh, excuse me, of the Islamophobia Committee of the September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrow. On behalf of the Islamophobia Committee, we want to let you know that you are in our thoughts and prayers during this remembrance of 9-11. The attacks of September 11th, 2001 affected not only victims and families, but Muslims in America and those perceived to be Muslim. We have used and will continue to use our voices to amplify your experiences. Our message to you is that we will continue to work tirelessly with the interfaith community to deliver a consistent message that prejudice and intolerance have no place in our country. We reach out to you with friendship and a fervent hope for peace and unity in our world. Today, 
we wish you comfort and pray for an end to all wars. Thank you so much. Just, uh, it's about 10 minutes before sunset or the Islamic time of Maghrib. So I just wanted to say that we're going to be uh, praying at around 745. There are restrooms located just behind me inside City Hall. So please just, we'll set up a time. So please, let's just pray at 745. Next, I would like to welcome in Reverend Ray Montgomery. He is the executive director of, uh, the executive director of PAC, the People Acting in Community Together. You'll be talking about MLK Jr.'s dream of building a beloved community. Can I please welcome to the stage Reverend Ray. Ashe. Shalom. Asalaamu Alaikum. And blessed be. I'm Reverend Ray, I'm the executive director for a faith-based organization called People Acting in Community Together. We are organizers where we collectively build power, people power, based on the most impacted people that systems have pushed to the margins. And we seek to pass policies that create transformative change. But what is change without a beloved community? I ask you, when you look at me, what, do, what does it invoke in you? What spirit bubbles up? Do you see me as your brother or as many of us who are, are not of a certain descent are othered? And there is a narrative that has been created to define who we are beyond the color of our skin, beyond lived experiences, beyond education, and beyond our faith. Martin Luther King Jr., yes, he had a dream. His 1968 dream was far different than his 1964 dream. See, in 1964, he just wanted equality where black people, African descents, were able to sit down at the counter. They were able to have same use of facilities. They were able to have a proper education. Moving beyond Jim Crow and the antebellum period of chattel slavery. In 1968, he began to realize that perhaps he had led the people to a slaughter because the laws that had been passed relational to the Civil Rights Act didn't really bring change. So the tension I push is that truth and laws and facts really don't create a beloved community. I would even push, and I'm a reverend and theologically trained, that faith really does not create a beloved community. MLK said, our goal is to create a beloved community. And this will require a qualitative change in our souls, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. In other words, to create the beloved community requires not only winning hearts and minds, but it also requires winning policies that places us in a position. So this beloved community is really about personal relationships, being able to have our own self-interest, yes, being able to have the things that we want, we need, we desire for our sons, our daughters, our grandparents, our, our children. We want things for ourselves, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when we have relationships with one another, it is the foundation, the building blocks of building this beloved community. When we share our stories and our lived experiences, our past, our history, our ancestry, we begin to see one another. And in seeing one another, we begin to know one another. And when you know someone, it's almost impossible to hate, to offend, to other, to create a narrative that is non-existent relational to them. 
because they are, they are your friends. They are your family. This is the beloved community that MOK wanted for us to be in relationship with each other, regardless of our faith, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of the origin of the world we come from, to know one another, to share lived experiences, to be compassionate. So the question I have is, in our faith, if the Creator gave us everything we needed, houses, jobs, money, health, and everything, would we still belong? And the answer would be no. Because if I don't know you, if I'm not in a relationship with you, it is impossible for me to show up for you. I have a relationship with Samina. It is just a phone call that she has to make. Reverend Ray, will you? And without knowing the facts, because I'm in relationship, because I spent time with her, I show up. That's what relationship building is. The ability to show up for one another in spite of the facts. So I'll leave you with this charge. It's a African word that says sawabosa. Sawabosa says, I see you, therefore I value you. I see you, therefore I value you. And the response when I say Sawabosa to you, your response is Sakona, which it says that I am here to be seen. Sabona and Sakona, I am here to be seen. That is the creation of the beloved community, that I see you and I value you and I am here to be seen. Then the last African word I'll leave you with as a charge with these three words is Ubuntu. That is, I am because we are. The only way that we can create a beloved community and live out the creed of Martin Luther King is to show up for one another, to be seen and value that we are because you are. I am because of you. So blessed be and may we always remember this day, what separates us and what brings us together. But above all, in order to be, we must be one together. Blessed be. Thank you so much again, Reverend, for the very insightful words. You know, interestingly enough, he was talking about how difficult it is to actually live with one another and about relationships. And I was thinking, you know, I, I'd recently gotten married and I was telling my wife, I said, uh, I said, you know, in Islam, if, if a wife is good to her husband, if her husband is happy with her, then she actually goes to paradise. And I said, wow, what an amazing thing it is. And she said, well, if it has to be said, if, if God says that if this is the only thing they have to do, imagine how difficult it must be to be nice. And I think in all these faith traditions, I think God tells us to be kind to one another, to love thy neighbor, to be with one another, because he understands how difficult it actually is. He actually understands that, you know, the natural, let's say the natural built-in fitra in Arabic of a person is to be selective and to be exclusive.